Well, good morning and welcome back to another week of lectures. Today we are going to be hearing all about material from section 2.8 on function inverses. But before we get into that, I wanted to uh, give you an update on the near future for the course and uh, a little bit further out for next week um, and a couple of things coming up. So as you can see, homework for sections 2, 3, 2, 6, and 2, 7 is due today. Uh, tonight at midnight we've got class this is this Wednesday. Last week we didn't have it because of national if pets had thumbs day. Um, but we do have it this Wednesday. And then this Friday we've got a quiz on those three sections that are due today for homework. Next week um, is a bit of a bigger week for us. Uh, so starting March 15th we've got homework due on section 2.8, 3.1, and 3.2. Wednesday we have class as usual. But then Thursday and Friday next week, there will be no quiz, but there will be a test. So there will be a, our chapters 1 and 2 test on Thursday and Friday of next week. Um, so I will be providing more details uh, the closer we get to that, but it will be a test that is open for 48 hours. Uh, you, you'll download it from Blackboard. You'll hand write your solutions on paper. You'll take fi uh, pictures or you'll scan the documents after you're done with them. You'll upload them to Blackboard, and I'll grade them from there. So uh, it's not timed. You don't have two hours to take it. Um, it's not open book. Uh, you just have to view the, the view the problems in the in the document that you'll download from Blackboard. Take it. If it takes you ten hours, it takes you ten hours. I, it won't. I'm gonna write it to uh, to last about an hour and twenty minutes uh, before this whole. Uh, quarantine and online course situation. I was giving tests at about this length, so I'm going to write a test that's the same length, and it should be should be pretty comparable to those old tests. Um, but it'll only be on chapters one and two. Uh, it won't have anything from from chapter three. Uh, so in your studies, don't worry about chapter three. Just focus on chapters one and two. It'll have a pretty even spread of questions from the first two chapters. Um, it won't be focused mostly on chapter 2 or mostly on chapter 1. It's going to be pretty evenly spread from every section there. So there will be at least one question from each section. Uh, there might be two or three from, from a couple sections, but uh, uh, it'll be pretty evenly spread out. Um, and with that, I think that's all the announcements that I had to make. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to stop by during office hours tomorrow. Um, from 1.45 to 3, or office hours uh, Thursday from 1.45 to 3, uh, or shoot me an email and I can get you the answers that you need. Um, but don't hesitate to reach out if you need help. So we'll go ahead and get started. This is just uh, uh, the things that I just said. just wanted to have them here in print for you as well. Okay, and we'll go ahead and get started. Section 2.8, inverse functions. So we've talked a lot about functions. Functions are things which take for each input, you know, they take that input and they assign it to only one output. So these are, these are not things where, uh, you know, you plug in the number one and you get two separate numbers out, like three and four. These are, these are rules, these are maps which take a number to a number. Now you could have things like a bunch of numbers sent to the same value, uh, which is very, very common actually. You take just your, your typical function f of x equals x squared, right? And if we looked at a graph of this, it would look like this. It would hit the origin here. You know, and if I plug in the number negative one, well it gets sent to negative one squared, which is one. So negative 1 gets sent to 1. Uh, if I take the number 1, well, it gets sent to 1 as well. So these are really common things. This one's, this one's a 2 to 1 function. These are really common things. Uh, you can have 3 to 1, 4 to 1. You can have an infinite number of things sent to 1. Uh, and so this is kind of the topic for today. Is, you know, here we started with we started with these inputs and those were known and I computed these outputs uh, and I discovered that two different inputs went to the same output 
But what if we sort of looked at it from the opposite direction? What if we looked at it from the idea of instead of plugging in some inputs, you know, this input, this input, this input, and looking at what outputs we get, what if we flip the direction and we think about it like this? We start at some output and we ask the question, what input gave us that output? So the first question that we started with was, what output do we get from this input? The question for today is, what input did we use to get this output? So we're starting in the reverse direction, or we, we're starting in the inverse direction. Um, and so I'll, <clears throat> I'll take a, a quick one here, and we'll use that simple function from before. And the question is, what input gave us this output of 4? So this, this output of 4 creates a horizontal line, y equals 4. And we're, we're kind of searching, you know, we're searching this x-axis and we're, we're looking through it and, and trying to determine what inputs gave us that. Oops, sorry, I see you can't see that there. So we're asking what inputs gave us that output. It's not a very complicated question here because we're working with x squared. So what x's, when squared, give you 4? Uh, I think we know the solution. There's actually two things. 2, when you square it, gets sent up to 4. And negative 2, when you square it, gets sent up to 4. This function, of course, looks like this in its graph. And so the, the answer to the question, uh, which input gave us 4 as an output, is actually two inputs, 2 and negative 2. So the inverse, if f is x squared, then the inverse of 4, okay, you see what I'm saying there, f inverse, there's a, there's a little negative one superscripted there. Um, that symbol represents the inverse. f inverse of 4 is actually the set of two numbers. Is this a function itself? Is the next question to ask. Is this inverse a function? And the answer is no. We plugged in 4 to this inverse. And the inverse is literally the question. Uh, if our function is x squared, uh, what input gives us 4? That's the literal inverse of this thing. Uh, well, it's two things, right? We plug in 4 to this question, to this inverse, we get two things out. This is not a function. Because we, we plugged in 1, we get 2. So this, this is a natural question, is what are the original functions? Here, x squared is our original function. What are the original functions? How do we classify them? so that we can, we can make sure that the inverse is a function. Because here we started off with x squared and we did not get as an inverse of another function. Is x squared a function? Yes, it is. Is its inverse a function? No, it's not. So what are the rules? What are the class classifications, the classes of functions that guarantee that our inverse is a function. That's the question for today. And there's actually a really, really simple thing to do. So if you've got the graph of any function, so I'll give the example of x squared again. If you take a graph of any function, and you, instead of doing a vertical line, draw any horizontal line. So here I'm going to draw a bunch of them. 
if any one of those horizontal lines that you've drawn intersects the graph at more than one spot. So here, all of these intersect this graph twice, right? This one here intersects at one point, and this one here, not at all. Nothing below here intersects it at all. If any horizontal line that you draw through the function of a, gra a graph of a function intersects at two or more places, it's, it does not have an inverse function. It does have inverses, but they're not well-defined like we saw above. You get multiple outputs. Okay, in that case, we say that you get pre-images of, you get pre-images, you, you don't get a function, inverse function. Um, so <clears throat> this is a really simple test. It's just like the vertical line test. This one's called the horizontal line test, and it's a quick check to see if something that you're given is a function or not. And I'm gonna just label here. Here we had two inputs for a given output, right? The horizontal line. Here we have one, and here we have no uh, inputs for the given outputs. Um, right. So that brings me to another vocabulary word. And I'm going to look at another example to, to bring this one home. So here's another graph. It's kind of a, a squiggly line gro going up. If I draw any horizontal line on this one, it only intersects ever at one place. There's no horizontal line you could draw there that intersects it more than once. So how many inputs are associated to each of these outputs? Just one. This is an example of a function that we call one to one. It is a one to one function. x squared was not x squared is sometimes 2 to 1, and sometimes 1 to 1, and sometimes nothing. <laughs> uh, you can think of other things that you've you know, ex experienced in the past. What is the kind of function it is? Is it 1 to 1? Is it 2 to 1? Is it 3 to 1? How many different inputs does it send to the same output? Okay. Well turns out this one-to-one -one class of functions, that's the class of functions that has a functional inverse. Not the two-to-ones, not the three-to-ones, it's the one-to-ones. The one-to-one -one functions have inverses. So what is the precise definition? Not this, not this graphical definition. The pre precise definition of a one-to-one -one function is a function is one to one um, sometimes there's hyphens I don't usually hyphenate it but your book does hyphenate it here um, a function is one to one if if you take two different numbers and plug them in take two different numbers and you plug them in you do get different outputs. Okay, so take two different inputs and that gives you two different outputs. That that explicitly means that um, one input goes to one one output. They're unique, right? There, there's nothing else. There's no different input that can give you the same output. So this is the precise definition of one to one, and the horizontal line test checks for that. Um, so. Another quick definition here is, is the precise definition of an inverse, which is what we've talked about. 
uh, and I, I said that it's essentially the, the question, well, what inputs gave me this output? That's the inverse question to what outputs do I get from these inputs? Uh, so if you have function f from domain a to range b, then its inverse function must have uh, domain, well, you plug in the output of the previous one. So that must be an element of the range b. And range, well, the inverse tells you the inputs that gave you that output. So the inputs from the previous function was, was a. OK. And here's the rule. Uh, OK, so what are, what are we doing here? We're essentially swipping, uh, switching the domain and range. So the function f takes an input from a, gives you an output in b. The inverse goes in the opposite direction. So it takes an input from b and then goes back to the, you know, the domain a. So it, it's here's your output as input, and then it gives you the as output the old inputs. <laughs> so you're switching like output input in, in in order, right? And here's how it's defined. And it's defined by um, the inverse image of y is x if and only if so i mean i mean this this is this is true always when f of x equals y so that's it and that's for any for any output y so Sorry, my son is upstairs trying to take a nap, I guess. And he's not, not going down very well. Um, so what are we saying here? What, what we're saying is, if you take a function and you plug in some input, and you get some output. Now, if this function has an inverse, then you're guaranteed, when you plug in that same output here, as your input for the inverse, you're guaranteed to get that input out. This was not the case with x squared, right? So if we took 4, and that's our output for some x squared, well, that could be like 2 squared, or that could be negative 2 squared, right? So we take here, this is our y, our 2 is our x, or our negative 2 is our x. If f of 2 equals 4, do we know that f inverse of 4 equals 2? Eh, not just that. We, we actually have negative 2 because f of negative 2 is also 4. Uh, what are some functions that it does work nicely with? Take any linear function, actually. And you definitely have this relationship. So let's let our function be 2x plus 1. OK. Um, let's see. If I say f of 1, if I, I'm just going to pick one at random here. That equals 2 times 1 plus 1, which is 3. OK. So now answer the question here. Inverse of 3. Are there any other? inputs that gave us 3. The answer is going to be no. Because we can we can do this thing. We can say, okay, let's take the output of 3 and let's solve this. We'll see if anything else can give us 3. Okay, we'll, we'll see if there's any pluses or minuses or anything. Well, if you solve this, 
the only possible thing that you're going to find is 1. So let's look up here at the definition then. We plugged in something specific, but if you do that for anything, right? We plugged in 1 and we got 3. If the only answer in the reverse direction is the exact same pairing, so if you plug in 1 here and you get 3 here, well then over here if you plug in 3, if the only possibility is 1 again, and that's true for any x and y that you happen to pick, not just this one in particular, well then you have an invertible function. Okay. So linear functions are invertible. They have inverses that are nicely defined, like this. And this is one way to find specific inverses. So like I just showed you, uh, we can find this f inverse of 3 is 1 by doing this. Here's the output, and we just solve it. Right? We're looking for those x's that gave us that output. So, so set the rule equal to your supposed output and try and solve. Um, okay. So I'm going to use this example as a nice little a nice little demonstration. of something called the inverse function property. The inverse function property says if you take a function and you compose it with its inverse and you plug something in, well, what are you, what are you gonna get? Well, it says you're always gonna get x. And if you do it in the reverse order, if you take the inverse of a function Pose it with the function in the other order, you're still going to get x. And this is no matter what. Okay, now, now this is kind of an interesting thing though. Let's think about f, and it takes a something in its domain a to something in its domain b, or sorry, it's range b, right? This is what a function does. Well, Let's look at this. F inverse, it takes something from B and it goes backwards to A. That's what F inverse does. And then F takes that thing back here to B. So this X is actually something in B. It's something in the range of your function f. So we usually call that like by the variable y instead, right? So maybe it's more appropriate for me to write it this way. If you take y something in the output of your function. You plug it into the inverse and then you get the inputs and then you map those inputs back to the range. You're going to get the same y out. Now, this one is in A. And we can think about it from this map up or this diagram up here. So, the function f starts with something in A and it brings it over to B. And then f inverse brings you back. So this is something in A. So we usually do call that by the variable x, so I'm going to leave it like this. Let's see how this works out with our specific example, 2x plus 1. So we already know that f of 1 equals 3, and we know that f inverse of 3 equals 1. I already worked that out for us. So let's see how this, how this handles this inverse function property. Let's see it in action with this simple example. Well, what is f com 
composed with F inverse. And what do we need to use here? We need to use the output. So 3. All right, we needed to pick that Y value for this first one. We can't use 1. We have to use 3. Um, so <clears throat> what this means is we take F and we plug in F inverse of 3. Okay, That's why I had to pick the 3. So this is, well, F inverse of 3 is just 1. So this is 1. Well, what is F of 1? It's 3. So when you compose a function with its inverse in this order, you always get the whatever you plug in back out. Okay, let's let's go the other way. F inverse of F. This time we need to plug in one. We can't plug in the three there. Because we don't know the rules yet for that. So here we go. This means F uh, F inverse of F of one. Well, F of one is three. So this is F inverse of three. And F inverse of three is one. So what we plugged in here, we got out, just like before. Okay, uh, I get a lot of students who ask why is this important? Why do we care that uh, you have to, why do we have to check both directions, right? F of F inverse, F inverse of F. You know, they're kind of saying the same thing that no matter what you plug in to this com composition, you're going to get it out. Right? No matter what, whether the, the F inverse is first or F is second. Well, it, it happens, it turns out that there's quite a lot of functions that have one of these properties but not both. So there's quite a lot of functions that, for example, will have this top thing. We say that they have a right inverse, but they don't have a left inverse, which is this one. There's lots of examples of these things. And these are things which don't have a functional inverse. They have a specific right inverse or a specific left inverse, but sort of overall, they don't have a total inverse. And so this is something that can be checked uh, horizontal line test checks for inverses. Uh, this can be used to check if two functions are inverses of each other. Uh, you just perform this composition and see if it works out in both directions. Um, if it does, you're good to go. You've got yourself an inverse. If not, you don't have an inverse. Okay, so you do, if, you, if you're given two functions and you're asked, are these inverses of each other? This is the way to check it, really. Um, you start composing them together and simplifying the result. And we'll do some examples of that on Wednesday. Uh, but uh, this, is, this, this is the test. You compose them together and you see if you get your input back out. Uh, and you have to do both compositions. OK, so next I'm going to go through <clears throat> kind of a standard procedure, uh, something that will definitely be used. in future math classes to come. This is a standard procedure for finding inverses of one-to-one -one functions. Uh, this is shorthand for one-to-one. -one. I hope that's OK. It's the number one dash one. Okay, so this, this means literally one to one. So it's the kind of function we were looking at earlier that passes the horizontal line test. Um, for every one input, there's only one output. Uh, for every one output, there's still in the inverse is just one possible input that gave it to you. So this is a standard procedure for finding inverses. This is just something that you can do. It's a mechanical process that you can go through to find the exact inverse like find the rule for it, um, find the formula for it. So it, it's really, really quite handy. And like I said, you're going to use this from time to time. Uh, 
So let's say we start with some function. So y is f of x, okay? This is what we have. Okay, uh, key example is y equals 2x plus 1. That's the example that we had earlier. Um, what you're going to try and do here, and, and there's two possible things that you can do next. The way I learned it is different from what your book does it, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it's the order in this case actually doesn't matter. So when you when you have a, a rule like this, y equals a function equals the rule of it, you're going to try next to solve it for x. Okay. So here on the right, I'll, I'll work this out. So y minus one is two x. And then I'm going to divide by 2. So y minus 1 over 2 is x. Okay? The next step is the easiest one, and then you're done, <laughs> is switch or interchange, as the book says. Interchange every x with y and every y with x okay so in your in the book they say just interchange x with y but i wanted to make sure to put every in there because sometimes students just do some of them and not all of them here we've just got one of them each so this is okay so we're the, what this means is literally Wherever you see a y, you're going to write an x. And wherever you see an x, you're going to write a y. Again, wherever you see a y, you write an x. And wherever you see an x, you write a y. That's what this interchange x with y means. So what you have here is actually f inverse of x. It's that easy. In the case of a linear function, it's that easy. In the case of other functions, it's not so easy. But this is the process that you can go through to find inverse functions. Okay, <clears throat> so it's really, it's really not so bad. Um, you won't be given crazy, crazy examples. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll do one more here just to illustrate this. So let's say we start with um, y equals, this is our example. Let's say we start with y equals x to the fifth. So take a number, raise it to the fifth power. That's, it's a big number usually, but we'll just do it. Then subtract 3, then divide by 2. Okay. So if I think about this in terms of the inverse or reverse process, I'm going to think about everything we did in the reverse order. What was the last thing we did in this equation? We divided by 2. So first, we're going to multiply by 2. What was the, what was the second to last thing we did in this equation? we subtracted 3. So now I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to add 3. What was the, well, the, in this case, the first thing we did, so we, we took a number to the fifth power. Well, that's the opposite of that is take the fifth root. Fifth roots don't require pluses or minuses. There we go. So the inverse function, if it exists, it's literally going to undo everything that your function did. So in this example, we first took something to the fifth power. Then we subtracted 3 from it. Then we divided that whole thing by 2. So what is this now saying? It's, it's saying do those things in the exact opposite order. Take a number and multiply it by 2. 
multiplication is the inverse to division. Then add 3 to that. That's because adding is the inverse to subtraction. And then take the fifth root of it all, because that's the inverse to taking something to the fifth. So the inverse function, which is obtained now, this is step two, which is obtained now by interchanging every x with y, fifth root of 2x plus 3 equals y. That's the inverse function. The inverse is just obtained by doing everything in the exact opposite order. Uh, and this gives rise to some really common everyday things. What are some inverse functions that you do? So, well, I wake up in the morning and I tie my shoes on my feet. You know, first I put my sock on, second I put my, sh my, my foot into my shoe, third I tie my shoes. How do I take them off without cheating and just slipping them off? Well, I first untie my shoe. That's the inverse to tying. Because the last thing I did before is the first thing I do this time. Well then, I take my foot out. That's the second thing I did before, which was in the middle. And so now it's the middle thing I do here, but in the reverse order. And then if I'm feeling really free, I'll take off my sock. It's the last thing I do here, but it was the first thing I did before. So you walk backwards through these processes that you did, these operations, and you always use the inverse operation at every step. That's the mechanical way to find the, ex the explicit rule for an inverse of a function. So I hope that helps. That is section 2.8. Uh, on inverses of one-to-one -one functions. Uh, we'll work through several problems of these uh, on Wednesday and um, in class. Again, we are meeting this, this Wednesday, and uh, so I will see you then. But until then, take it easy and have a great couple days.